You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Well, God bless you, and welcome to Treasures in Heaven. From all of us at WCAT Radio, we're glad you're with us. I am your host, Dr. William Ailes. In this show, one of my favorite subjects, How God Destroyed Satan. In Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 2, verse 14. Since, therefore, the children share flesh and blood, referring to us, he, Christ himself, likewise shared the same things, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. The fear of death is commonplace in mankind because, like taxes, it's inevitable. God intervened in his creation through his Son to free us from this fear of death. The fear, of course, of the unknown. He sent his Son to be a Savior the perfect sacrifice for sin. God's enemy, Satan, thought he would blot out the light sent by heaven, sent by God, by crucifying the Christ. But as Jesus bled on the cross, his blood would cleanse our sins. He would become the perfect sacrifice for sin dying as the Passover lamb on the holy day of Passover, the same time the temple authorities were slaying their lambs to sacrifice. Christ was fulfilling the law. He was fulfilling the plan God had in mind, the plan that Satan didn't understand. Satan thought he was blotting out the light sent by heaven. In contrast, he ended up handing us the perfect sacrifice for sin, which would open the door to an eternal kingdom through Christ. That's not what Satan had in mind. God had outwitted Satan, and Satan had no way to reverse his fate. In the book of Revelation, in chapter 20, Christ gave revelation to John about Satan's ultimate fate. Revelation 20, verse 7, When the thousand years are ended, Satan will be set free from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. They traveled the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, Jerusalem, But fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet were. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Satan will be tormented day and night forever and ever. The destruction Satan brought upon the earth and mankind will be upon him for eternity. That's God's justice. Thank God for God and his justice. Through God's Son, it became a reality. God foresaw it all. This will come to pass after the thousand-year reign of Christ, known as the Millennial Kingdom, when he reigns from Jerusalem. How did all this begin Lucifer is the name that God gave to his angelic model of perfection. Created as a magnificent angel, Lucifer was with God on the holy mount, the pinnacle of the heavens. The guardian cherub walked faultlessly in all his ways until evil was conceived within. Lucifer became obsessed with what was reserved for God, worship. Therewith, the angel of light turned to darkness. And we have two very revealing prophecies in the Old Testament, one from Ezekiel and one from Isaiah. 
Ezekiel 28, verse 12. You were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in all your ways. From the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God, and I expelled you, guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. Pride overtook Satan. Humility was crushed within him. Isaiah 14, verse 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will, ascend, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. That's the height of arrogance. Lucifer wanted to be like the most high. Not going to happen. The former guardian cherub spoke his prophecy into the ears of God. The throne of heaven would be his. He would be like the most high. By his own power, Lucifer transformed himself into the highest ranking dark angel, Satan. The son of the dawn became the angel of darkness. Pride extinguished divine light, and wisdom was corrupted. Now the fallen angel would rule his own kingdom, having ultimate command over one-third of the angels, those who rejected God with Lucifer. We see that in Revelation 12, verses 1 through 4 when Mary gave birth to the Christ child, and of course through Herod, Satan tried to kill the Christ child. And in Revelation 12, verse 1, Christ gave revelation to John. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was with child and cried out in labor and pain to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven. There was a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. The dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as he was born. She gave birth to a male child who was to rule all nations with an iron scepter. That is the Son of God, the only one who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter in his reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years, the scepter of the king. And her child was caught up to God, to his throne. So in six or five verses, we have a dramatic summary of the spiritual warfare that was taking place at the time of the birth of the Christ child. The dragon, who was Satan, dragged a third of the stars of heaven, a third of the angels with him, to go to war against God to take out the Christ child. As we know, Lucifer failed to kill the Christ child through Herod, so he would then later pursue killing the Christ child through the temple authorities in Jerusalem. That's where we pick up the story. In the Gospels, we have this spiritual war being carried out. And... With Herod failing to kill the Christ, 
Satan had plan two, to use the temple authorities in Jerusalem against him. They would participate in the conspiracy to kill Jesus of Nazareth, which on the surface sounds odd. Christ is coming to Israel, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, to save them. But the temple authorities weren't interested in this Savior because they had a different agenda. In John 11, verse 47, then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin, which is the high court of the temple. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man, Jesus, performing many miraculous signs. If you let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. The temple authorities did not want everyone to believe in Jesus, the Son of God, because their agenda was their place, their role as the big shots of the temple. And they felt they were the guardians of their nation. Then one of them, named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. In other words, this high priest of the temple thought he was saving the Jewish nation and his role as high priest by sacrificing Jesus. Look how twisted this is. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. And we know from John 8 that Jesus confronted these people. This is a flashpoint. The Pharisees, the temple authorities, are concerned about their place in Israel and potentially losing their country to the Romans. They felt Jesus had to die if both were to be saved. That's their perspective, as wrong as it was. But thus, the fulfillment of Satan's purpose would come by way of flesh and blood. Instead of Herod, now he's going to use the temple authorities. This conflict in Jerusalem was the flashpoint between two spiritual powers. Whereas evil manifested itself through the Pharisees, the divine power of God manifested itself through Jesus. In Christ's verbal exchange with his temple authorities, his adversaries, he disclosed their hypocrisy and identified their true nature. John chapter 8 is a very telling chapter. John chapter 8, as it is, you are determined to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. You are doing the things your own father does. If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and now am here. I have not come on my own, but he sent me. You belong to your father, the devil. Think about that. This is Jesus Christ talking to the temple authorities, those who are supposed to represent the one true God, have forfeited and traded their allegiance. He said, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. That's Satan working through his own henchmen, like wolves in sheep's clothing. Satan as, an, Satan as the angel of darkness can appear as an angel of light. That's the deception. He, Satan, was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his own native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. 
We also know from another record that the Pharisees, the temple authorities, love money. And we know the love of money is the root of all evil. As Christ said in the Sermon on the Mount, you cannot serve God in money. To love one, to hate the other. The temple authorities had given in to the temptation of power and money, and it just worked on their ego, and that's how they would move forward. And nobody was going to stand in their way, especially this guy, Jesus, performing all these miracles that the people then, of course, believed. Satan had darkened the minds of those who sat upon religious authority. Their souls belonged to darkness. They were sealed shut by the seed of Satan because Satan was their father. The Pharisees' perception of reality demanded the death of Jesus. The children of darkness would fulfill the will of their father, Satan, and they would falsely accuse Jesus of blasphemy against God to carry out their own agenda. Look at this exchange in Matthew 26, verse 63. Christ is now hauled in to, to give account of himself. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ the Son of God. And here's Jesus' answer. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, in the future you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered, and with that, Christ's fate was sealed. They would crucify the Christ. Accused of blasphemy, Jesus would face crucifixion. Thus, Satan believed he would stop the kingdom of God through Jesus' death, blotting out the light sent by God. In reality, Satan participated in giving mankind the ultimate sacrifice for sin because the Pharisees slew God's lamb. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Just as the Passover lamb in Egypt saved the Israelites from death, so the lamb of God would save souls from mortality. Jesus sacrificed his own life so that others could live eternally. Now, listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age knew it, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Had Satan understood the mystery that God had hidden within and God ordained before the ages for our glory. Those who believe in the Christ, the coming glorification of those who believe in the Christ, had Satan known what God had hidden within, had the rulers of darkness known this, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That's the wisdom of our God. In his chess match against Satan, checkmate. Satan now has nowhere to turn. He has lost the spiritual war. When we step out the door and we go into the world, our Lord and Savior turn the tables on God's enemy on our behalf for our ultimate glorification with Christ when he returns for us. To me, that's just astounding. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. Christ was crucified as the Lamb of God. He died for us. This is part two. But death could not keep its hold on him. Why? Well, we know 
that the wages of sin is death. But Christ lived a sinless life. Therefore, it's impossible for death to keep its hold on a completely innocent human being. Listen to what Peter said on the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested to you by God with powerful works and wonders and signs, which God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, you have taken him, who was handed over to you by the ordained counsel and foreknowledge of God, by the lawless hands, have crucified and killed him, whom God raised up by loosening the pull of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. God had every legal right to raise his son from the dead because the penalty of sin is death, but Jesus lived a sinless life. Thus, death could not keep its hold on him. And with the resurrection, which has on the uh, holy day, the Feast of First Fruits, Christ presented himself to the Father in heaven as the ultimate atonement for sin. Hebrews 9. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. He has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Remember how when Mary recognized Jesus, thinking he was the gardener, and he said to Mary, touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to my father? Because on the very day of the resurrection, Christ would ascend to the Father. Mary couldn't touch him. He had to remain in the state he was in, the perfect sacrifice. That's why later on, he told Doubting Thomas, here, put your hand in my wounds. That's the difference. Christ ascended to God, to the heavenly sanctuary, presenting himself as the ultimate sacrifice for sin on the day of his resurrection. He returned to the earth, and then, of course, he was on the earth for 40 days before his ascension, his final ascension to the right hand of God. See, Jesus did away with sin and its consequences. He did not receive the sinful nature that Adam had passed on to humankind because God was his father. Therefore, He was in a position to live a sinless life and die as God's gift to man. Hence, any person who accepts this sacrifice is granted eternal life, receives the Holy Spirit. Satan lost his trump card over man because mortality was permanently defeated. Christ destroyed the dark angel by nullifying his power over death. Where we started, Hebrews chapter 2. By his Jesus' death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Because once we have Christ as our Savior, once we believe and and make him our Lord, once we believe in the miracle of the resurrection, once we confess and remove our sins openly to God, We are humbling ourselves before our creator. He responds because we are accepting his gift, his sacrifice for sin. We accept the sacrifice, and then he grants us cleansing of sin and eternal life. Just like the thief who hung on the cross next to Christ, said, remember me to Christ when you come into your kingdom? This guy's a thief. He's so wicked, they're crucifying him. Obviously, he has a criminal record. He's not a holy guy. But what did he do on the cross? Remember me 
when you come into your kingdom. He humbled himself before Jesus on the cross, recognizing him as the Christ. And what did Christ say? Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. That's the new covenant looking right at us. Christ on the cross, the thief on the cross, there's the new covenant. We humble ourselves before God by embracing Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah, as the Savior of the world. Freedom from the fear of death is central to Christ's gospel. Eternal life for human souls is not what Satan had envisioned when Jesus bled on the cross. Preoccupied with Jesus' death, the fallen angel could not foresee the ramifications of his actions. With the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension, all bloodlines now have an advocate, Jesus Christ, in the presence of God. The Son of God became man's mediator. The Son of God became our great high priest who baptizes the Holy Spirit. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. Paul wrote this to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. He is the only great high priest that we have. Hebrews 7:25. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by man. This is where our Lord and Savior currently resides. In the true tabernacle, on the right hand of God, interceding on our behalf. What a blessing. What a blessing to know this story, the wisdom of our God, to bring forth this phenomenal story into the world and those of us who embrace it as the truth for what it is. Paul explained it this way in Romans 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, for if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to many. Jesus had to be a man. He had to be one of us. We could not be redeemed by an angel. We could not be redeemed by an animal. Our Savior had to be one of us, like it said in Hebrews. He took upon himself flesh and blood. He was the living word of supernatural intelligence in the flesh. He who has seen me has seen the Father. Nothing else in this world other than Jesus Christ. To summarize, we are blessed beyond blessed. I thank God every day for my Lord and Savior, our Lord and Savior, and what he accomplished on the cross 2,000 years ago. As we go into this new year of 2022, let us rejoice every day in what God accomplished through his son and how we were brought to God through Christ. Well, God bless you. And from all of us at WCAT Radio, good night. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.